Welcome to the Arts Catalyst. Um, my name is Sandra, and I think I'm going to hand you over to Mark Pilgerson from Stranger Tractor, who's going to kind of go over what's going to be happening tonight. So, thank you, Mark. Thank you, Sandra. And thank you, all of you, for coming. Uh, yeah, I'm Mark from Stranger Tractor, um, and thank you to Arts Catalyst for hosting us here this balmy evening. Um, so tonight's event, The Living World, we're going to be asking questions about what is alive, what it means to be alive, what if everything is alive. Um, and we've got two distinguished speakers, uh, Dr. Robert Wallace, who's Professor of Visual Cultures at Richmond University, and soon to be Dr. Eric Davis. Um, from San Francisco, California. And um, the breakdown is going to be that Robert is going to do a kind of historical and cultural overview of uh, animist ideas and themes and the different ways in which animism has been perceived and interpreted uh, for the past 150 ish years. Uh, then Eric and Robert are going to do a, have a conversation, a discussion on some of the themes raised and some of the larger issues that that relates to. Um, and then we'll have a 15 minute cool off period. It's going to get heated. Um, and at which point I will uh, we'll swap tables and uh, Eric is going to read a piece about the electromagnetic world, and myself and Misty, the modular instrumentation for space-time yantra, uh, will be performing uh, and processing Eric as, as he reads. So, um, so the main thing to remember is that there'll be a 15-minute break in between, in between those. Okay, so thanks very much, Dr. Robert Wallace. Hello. Thank you, Mark. Delighted to be here. I'm not going to talk for very long. I'm going to talk probably for about 20 minutes, something like that. And my purpose really is to just give an overview of the subject of animism and the way that we have constructed animism in the modern period and how various people such as anthropologists and scholars of religion are rethinking that animism in light of taking indigenous people seriously. And I want to do this perhaps to point to some of the sorts of things that might appear in my discussion with Eric, who ceased to be animate, he's disappeared in time. <laughs> <coughs> okay, first slide please, Mark. Animism in, in some ways goes back to the beginning of modern thinking, but term becomes crystallized in the late 19th century with the work of Fraser and Tyler, and it's Tyler that I want to focus, focus on here. Tyler saw primitive people and their religion in particular as being some of the earliest, if not the earliest, forms of religion. And animism specifically as a form of projecting our own sense of self and personhood and life onto the world around us. So this would be a mistaken belief in Tyler's point of view, quite obviously from a rational point of view, how can a tree contain a soul? But this is how Tyler conceived of indigenous or what he termed primitive people conceiving of their world, various living things like trees, but also inanimate objects, including stones as having souls. For Tyler, this was a mistaken belief, and as cultures evolved, religions evolved, leading up to that wonderful thing, monotheism, um, these mistaken beliefs increasingly came, became corrected. <coughs> Recent thinking in the last decade or so has reviewed Tyler and other thinkers' conception of animism, particularly in light of anthropological work in the Amazon, 
<clears throat> and the main thinker here I want to deal with is Eduardo Viveros de Castro. And Viveros de Castro, in, in, term, in terms of his informants and respecting their perspectives on the world, reconceives of animism as not being about the projection of life into inanimate objects, but, but being about various um, Amazonian communities recognizing that the world is filled with persons, only some of whom are human. And to borrow from another anthropologist, Irving Halliwell, writing in the late 1950s about the Ojibwe, the Anishinaabe speakers in Northern <coughs> North America, they conceive of a world which is filled with persons, only some of, hum only some of whom are human, and they, their language makes a grammatical distinction between those things which are animate and those that are not. And what, how this translates into English is that there are such persons as human persons, but beyond that community there are also tree persons, stone persons, fish persons, and so on. I think it's important at this point to point out that these are not persons that are like people like us, like human people. These are other than human people that have their own understandings of the world, their own perspectives on it, their own communities, their own stories. So they are living in their world and have a perspective on us. So that would be a, an other than tree perspective on human persons. So in, in this sense, this, this rethinking, while it's subtle and involves language in lots of ways, isn't about projection, isn't about anthropomorphism. And I hope that as I go through that, that will come across more clearly. Now, for animists, if the world is filled with persons and not all of them are human, then, on a daily basis, animists brush shoulders with other than human persons. And it's important to have respect, or what Judy Cruikshank in her book, uh, which I'll come back to, calls uh, proper social comportment. So it's important to be respectful to the world we live in, because it is living and there are various beings that we can make relationships with, and we want those relationships, be, ideally, to be harmonious ones. But of course, human persons, like probably other persons too, do err in our actions in the world. And relationships can become imbalanced. An example of that, would say, would be a hunter who uses the wrong sort of spear to kill a seal. And the seal becomes angry. Um, its spirit, in our discourse, problematic word, um, its spirit then steals the soul of the hunter and that makes him sick. And so it's important to try and repair that relationship. It's not so much about healing the sickness as repairing the relationship. It then becomes important for shamans to be involved in the picture. Next slide, please, Mark. Um, shaman, oh, I, I'll come back to shamans, actually. No, we'll do, do glaciers this. So for, for, to give you an example of indig indigenous animism, um, in her book, do glaciers listen? Julie Cruikshank asks this question and, and treats her informants in the Yukon in Canada, Tlingit speakers, who conceive of glaciers as being a form of other than human persons. They would be glacier persons. And they have their own understandings of this world, probably much slower than ours, but they can take offence at human actions. And one of the things that the Tlingit do is make an analogy between the movement of glaciers and the actions of Greece, so cooked animal fat, for example. So there's a taboo, there's a, a problematic issue of cooking animal fat on top of glaciers. And there are various examples from the colonial period of white people going into the Yukon, cooking bacon on top of glaciers, and the indigenous stories go that the glacier responds angrily, collapses, generally causes sickness or injury, that kind of thing. So for the Tlingit speakers, glaciers do listen and they can be spoken to, or more importantly, relationships can be made with them. And it's this issue of relationality which I think is key to this new animism which distinguishes it from the old. So old animism was about imputing soul or life into inanimate objects. The new animism is removes that boundary between what is animate and inanimate. That dualism disappears altogether because it's a problematic one constructed by Victorian anthropologists. And instead of that, we have a relational world and we make relationships 
with various persons, including what we would call objects. <coughs> Let's go to these shamans now, please, Mark. So, if relationships are are soured in some way, if there's imbalance created by us erring in our relations with others, then it becomes important for, for various people to be involved in repairing this imbalance. And shamans are usually the people who are the key mediators in this process. Now, there's been a great deal written about shamans. And there's been recently a particular focus on altered states of consciousness and shamans being those people who alter their state of consciousness in order to travel to a spirit world, journeying as it's called, in order to talk to spirits or souls, somehow repair the imbalance, and then return the soul of that hunter who's had his soul stolen. Um, but there are various problematic areas with this, I think, and I want to reconfigure our understandings of shamanism in light of new animistic thinking. Because the focus on shamanism, particularly recently from a, a neurotheological perspective, the idea that God's in the brain, made up by us due to neurochemistry, is that there's a focus then on shamans' altered states of consciousness and the inner experiences, the inner visions that shamans have. That is, they have hallucinations, they alter their consciousness, they hallucinate, and what they think they're doing in the spirit world isn't real, it is, to use Tyler's kind of word, mistaken. They believe something that is a hallucination to be true, and that is incorrect. But I think it's important to think about shamans in more sensitive terms, rather than in our own terms, and particularly, particularly our obsession with altered states. And that's because shamans aren't the ultimate arbiters of their community's ontology, their community's ways of understanding the world, and their epistemologies, their ways of knowing the world. Shamans don't construct everything, and I think that the literature on shamans has tended to overemphasize their roles and things. Actually, shamans are part, often, part of animist ontologies. So shamans are animists, and if that's the case, then what shamans are doing when they do what we call altering their consciousness is from their point of view, entering, a, it, it, it's from their point of view, adjusting themselves to meet the communicative level of other than human persons. So we would say that shaman lying on the floor unconscious, um, having swilled a hallucinogenic brew, um, is having hallucinations. From the shaman's point of view, and okay, I'm, I apologize for generalizing, from the shaman's point of view, he or she has adjusted him or herself to meet the communicative level of, say, glacier persons. Because you can't just talk to a glacier and expect it to understand and communicate with you. You have to adjust yourself to meet that level. So rather than talking about altered states of consciousness, I want to borrow Graham Harvey's term from his excellent book, Animism, Respecting the Living in the World, from 2005, which is that we reconfigure this into adjusted styles of communication. So ASCs become adjusted styles of communication. An example of this, next slide please, Mark. Uh, this is a Dahad shaman in Mongolia. Uh, and Mongolia is a part of the Locus Classicus, the sort of original place that shamanism is seen to derive from. And the Dahad shaman wears a costume. He's also beating a drum here, but I want to focus on the costume. And he does this in order to adjust himself to meet the communicative level of other than human persons. This isn't just donning a costume, a piece of paraphernalia to look particularly showy to your community, although of course it has that job as well. What it actually does, I think in more useful terms, and I'm quoting from Peterson here from 2007, it induces a momentary transformation, enabling the shaman to attain otherwise unattainable points of view. The magical capacity to cross-cut the boundaries between human and non-human beings. If we put that differently, shamans have access to various bodily perspectives which they adopt through donning costume and similar acts so that they can articulate or externalize that understanding, that other than human person's understanding, to their human community. Going back in time, I want to think now briefly about how this reconceiving of animism might be useful for understanding an archaeological example. 
and that's through um, prehistoric cave art. I've seen some examples here of various um, therianthropic, therianthropic beings, humans combined with animals, which can be interpreted in all sorts of ways, and obviously it's, uh, it's well known that we will never know what this material is about, we can only interpret it. But I think there are, there are um, useful ways of interpreting it, and less, less useful ways. And the Lascaux shaft scene, famous scene from the Dordogne in, in France, in the cave at Lascaux, um, has traditionally been interpreted as a form of hunting magic, um, despite the fact that the faun remains from the Upper Paleolithic are mainly not the animals that are painted. Um, it's been interpreted as um, a narrative of, of daily life in some way, or um, identifying uh, prey animals, so a teaching aid for young hunters. And I think this is all fairly uh, simplistic and, and not useful in, in relation to really trying to understand this material. So thinking about this in terms of shamanism, what the what I call the neuro-theological approach to shamanism argues is that what we have is a, a shaman's hallucination. Uh, the shaman is the stick figure with the, the erect penis. There's a bison on the right-hand side. And then in the middle there's some sort of stick with a bird on top. And from a shamanistic interpretation, a neuro-theological interpretation, the shaman is in an altered state of consciousness uh, in order to talk to the bison spirit, um, has somehow uh, become, um, the, the bison has become angry, um, injured the shaman, um, and it's all about, an altered state of consciousness is all about a hallucination. If we look at the bigger picture of this in terms of new animism, situating shamans within that ontology within which they work in, then I think that we're dealing with something a, a bit different here. We do have a transformation, but it's not so much a physical transformation as a transformation in perspective. In that sense, if, it, if this is a shaman, um, the shaman is transformed into something which is much like the bird-topped figure. So they stylistically share similarities in being stick-like figures and having avian characteristics. So the shaman has been in contact with the bird, that bird person, in order to perhaps communicate with the other than human persons also depicted in the scene. Right, how's all this relevant to us in the modern world? Yes, please, Mark. I think that there, there are ways in which we relate to our world. Um, we do build relationships with the world around us. Far from Descartes' understanding of us being embedded in our minds and our bodies being problematic things, actually we're viscerally driven beings, we make decisions based on emotions, we're not solely analytical and objective. In fact, most of the time we aren't. So the sorts of ways we build relationships would be with our pets, whom we name and we respect and we look after, much like we would humans. There are other things that we also relate to. Um, our cars we often name and look after and probably have kind of respectful relationships, except when they break down and then we beat them as if that's somehow going to help us. That's John Cleese in Clockwise from 1986. Um, Computers. Sometimes we hate our computers, sometimes we think they hate us, um, but we do build relationships with them and we build relationships through them in an increasingly connected world through Facebook and Twitter and so on. So there are ways in which we can see how animism is relevant to us because we do relate to the world around us. And I know these are kind of crass examples. Um, it, it might be more difficult to relate to certain so-called inanimate things than others. Tupperware might be difficult to relate to, might be more difficult to relate to Tupperware than a cat or a tree that you like. Um, but it is interesting that the, the Tupperware advert of 2013 is good for life, uh, given the topic of this talk. Um, but what's helpful from an indigenous point of view is that not everything is animate all of the time. So indigenous animists don't think that everything is speaking to us all the time, we must relate to everything all of the time, we can't possibly do that. Some things are animate and some things are not. And it's up to us to, to, to communicate in order to find out what is and what isn't and what's relevant to us. Returning to art, um, there are a number of ways in which um, contemporary artists have treated 
issues surrounding animism and, and what I've talked about so far. And a good example of that would be Marcus Coates. And in 1999, he did two, two performances. Uh, one was entitled Stoked, which is the top left slide. It's from a, a video in which he constructed um, two shoes which would be the prefer perfect propor proportions for making the footprints of a stoat. And he bound these to his feet and then tried to walk like a stoat, which resulted in him tripping up, stumbling, looking like he's twisted his ankle, that kind of thing, which I think is a really interesting and creative and in, in some ways humorous way of trying to to get into the perspective of another than human person, a stoked person, as we might call it from a new animist point of view. Another was uh, a goshawk, also from 1999, in which Coates was um, strapped to the top of a pine tree for some hours in order to try and adopt the view of a hawk surveying its domain and hunting. In 2004, Coates performed um, what he called a journey to the lower world, in which he adopted some new shamanistic techniques um, and went to a community living in a tower block that was about demolished, about to be demolished. And he asked the community about the problems that they faced as a result of this and whether or not his shamanistic journey to the lower world could perhaps give them some useful feedback on their situation. And so he donned the uh, the costume, a shamanistic-like costume, including a reindeer's head, and then he did some improvisational stuff like tying his keys to his shoes as if they were shamanistic rattles, and he proceeded to, I would say he probably altered his consciousness, um, and it certainly looked like he adjusted his style of communication because he came back and he talked to the community about how he'd met a moorhen and a number of other animals and birds which had perhaps given some useful information. So Coat is an interesting example of this because he's, I think he's pointing to the way in which we do relate to the world and we try to relate to the world, however difficult it might be to adopt the perspective of other than human persons, particularly when we're modern and we're not brought up with this very different frame of understanding. And he does try and relate and he does that in useful ways and even does things for various communities, which is quite a shamanistic-like thing to do. I want to just close this in introduction by giving three examples um, which, are, which particularly re resonate for me in terms of animism. And the first of those is to do with stone axes. The first on the right hand side is a Paleolithic stone axe. It was recently on show at the British Museum in their Ice Age art show, um, which I think is a, a stunning object, not a word I, look, I like to use, but it's that art historical language. Um, a stunning object beautifully crafted. It's about, um, about 30 centimetres tall, but only 9 millimetres thick. So the craftsmanship that it would have taken to produce this stunning thing really is quite something. And f for me, in that sense, aesthetically, it becomes more than just a tool. It becomes quite an artistic thing. The same goes for these polished stone axes bottom left here, which are from the later Neolithic in Britain. And I've pointed to these because these are later in the period, but these certainly weren't functional objects. Because they were polished, and that would have taken a long time to do, these weren't things that would have been used for chopping down trees because that carefully curated polish would have been damaged. And what we know from the archaeological record is that actually these were probably prestige objects that were passed and traded at great distances from all the way from Orkney down to Wessex huge distances for people um, who were moving along trackways over thousands of miles. And by analogy, if we were to think about why this was happening, why these things were, these objects, these things were important, um, we could look at uh, the cultures of New Guinea. And you have two images there of uh, big men, and the, the guy on the left is holding a, a polished stone axe. Um, what's interesting about their understanding of the world is that gender and bodies aren't things which are fixed as we have them in the West. So that in terms of trading the gift, the object, uh, a polished stone axe for a New Guinea big man could actually change your gender. And that would therefore also change your identity, your personhood, your perspective on the world and the way you relate to the world. 
So these sorts of axes resonate for, particularly for me in terms of animism. Um, getting more straightforwardly back to art, I'd like to cite the example of Austin Osman and Spare, an artist working in the early part of the 20th century in London. Um, I, I own these two pictures, top right and the central upper one. Um, this one I don't. But while these two are perhaps uh, straightforwardly a landscape and a portrait, the one at the bottom is a self-portrait and has this strange being on the left. Um, to the top left is a slide of um, spare, uh, perhaps a slightly staged painting um, with his eyes closed because it said that his father said that his son drew in a trance. And there have been various um, pieces of literature which have referred to a spare as a shaman-like figure, which I don't want to get into. What I want to think about is these objects themselves, these artworks, which have their own presence and agency. And I wouldn't be the only person to say that not only do they change with the time of day, the season, um, and so on, but they also have a, a presence which really is quite affecting. And some people have described how they can't actually keep an artwork because it disrupts their, their, their lives too much, their dreams. So I think that these sorts of artworks really do have a presence which are interesting to consider in terms of new animism. And the final slide I'd like to point to is a work by Kathy Ward and Sonafell from 2008, I think. Yeah, 2008. Um, and Again, this is an object, uh, this is an artwork which has real, real presence and an effect. And in particular, there is a, a sweet point when, like listening to music, um, when viewing Kathy's work that you can reach when you're looking at it, that it totally absorbs you, totally has an engaging quality. So I'm just going to close by speaking something which I wrote about this particular picture. A black void is dominant. The gaze of this unblinking, lidless eye is difficult to avoid. It draws me in for a closer look. The tendrils of some alien, sticky thread circumvent the void, and these projections rotate into points, teeth-like, all-consuming. Hair-like strands egress from the central mouth and contort their way across the picture plane. Captivated by the spectacle before me, the yawning black sun has now taken on massive proportions and appears to pulsate spasmodically in some hitherto unknown astronomical event. Following the threads of a journey, I pass writhing worm and turd-like forms, get ensnared in nets and skeins and descend into swirling black holes. The seething mass of ever-replicating filaments becomes dizzyingly, exquisitely alive, and after losing myself in this vision for a time, by gazing into a scryer's crystal ball, I return to the centre, to the yawning dark void, which continues to stare back, unfathomable, ambivalent and stark.